Chapter 17, Nightlight Dawns. The five guardians were in a full frenzy for the rest of the day, or more accurately, Omric, North, Bunnemund, and Tuthiana debated all morning while Nightlight remained still and quiet. He watched his friends study grain after grain of Monsunuzi sand under a never-ending array of magnifying glasses, microscopes, spyglasses, cosmic ray detectors, and even a crystal clear egg that Bunnemund assured them could pinpoint the precise origin of the sand and its exact age. It did neither. After hours of testing and studying, the only conclusion they came to was that this sand was, well, sand. It obviously had magical properties, but what exactly were those properties and how were they triggered? No one knew. And so they argued on about everything, whether to try to follow Sandman, how to follow him if they ever could agree to follow him, where he might have gone and what to do if they found him. Should they split up and try to find Catherine? Should they call the lunar llamas? Should they try to contact the man in the moon? And most irritatingly, why hadn't Sandman asked them to join him? They studied charts, they consulted clouds, they looked into the past, they tried to see the future, they grumbled and worried and fussed. Though Nightlight remained silent, it was not without purpose. He had not yet told his friends that he could read the sand, which was not unusual. He spoke only if he thought it was necessary. He was always curious about the ways of the tall ones, as he called adults. He did not think of them as smart or intelligent. He thought of them in terms of other qualities, those things that made a tall one good, kindness, bravery, trust, fun. But if they were cruel, lied maliciously, or were mean, then Nightlight viewed them as bad. North, Omric, Bunnemund, and Tuthiana were Nightlight's favorite tall ones. He understood that they were the most good, and he understood that they had knowing, which was his way of calling them wise. Then he thought about Sandman's dream story and the new tall one, Mother Nature. Was Mother Nature good or bad? Now that he knew her story, he was not sure. As a child, she had been kind and wild and brave, like Catherine, and like himself. But so much hurt had come to her, so much loss. It had changed her, and it had changed Pitch. Nightlight stared at his friends. They seemed changed, too, like they'd lost their knowing and bravery and tallness. Now all they did was talk the loud, as he referred to arguments, and do the nothing. This scared Nightlight. He put his sandy fingertips to his forehead again. The sand. Just having it touch his brow made him feel calm and clear. Suddenly, he felt himself understand his friend's behavior. The sand had given him a bit of the knowing. His friends, they were hurting too. Catherine being gone was hurting them so much that they were scared, just like he was. And he hated feeling scared and hated all this hurt. He hated it so much he couldn't stand it any longer. He thought of the words of Catherine, stories that had washed away when Mr. Cordy had cried. He could almost hear them from his pocket. It was as if Catherine herself was calling out to him. He had to do something. He leapt up and slammed his staff on the floor as hard as he could, over and over, till the room began to shake. The other guardians stopped in mid-argument and looked at him with bewildered awe. Now that he had their attention, he began to dart about the room in his faster-than-light way, herding them toward the center of the room. Hey, squirt, North harumphed. Who do you think you are? You can't shove. Nightlight kicked the Cossack firmly in the rear, moving him along. He's gone mad, said Bunnyman, just before Nightlight grabbed him by both ears and yanked him into place. Or he's playing some sort of game, mused Ombrick, as Nightlight jerked his beard firmly and pulled the old wizard along with it. Tuthiana began to see what the boy was up to. She moved to the room center without any coaxing. There they stood, as Nightlight had insisted, in a sort of circle looking at one another, perplexed and ain't curious about what the boy was up to. Nightlight now sat cross-legged on the floor in the center of them. He held up Mr. Cordy and turned the magic book's pages slowly. Then, when he found the right spot, he stood and thrust the book close to each of their faces. Those four, those magnificent four, the bravest and most wise of all the tall ones who had ever lived, these guardians of the worlds of children, stood sheepishly as a boy, admittedly a magical boy, but still a mere boy, showed them what Sandman's sand was capable of doing and how to unlock its magic. Nightlight held his sand fingertips to his lips and blew. The sand drifted toward them, and as it sprinkled around their eyes and faces, for the second time in 24 hours, the four instantly fell asleep. In perfect unison, they teetered, teetered some more, then fell backward onto the floor. They were snoring before they'd landed. Nightlight again pointed to Mr. Cordy and said to his napping friends, Catherine's story, her life, her hurts, her, that's what we save. Remember your knowing, be stronger than the scared and the hurt, and dream a way to save our Catherine. Then Nightlight spoke to Mr. Cordy. Be writing about, uh, be writing what just happened on your pages, Mr. Q, that today, Nightlight, the boy guardian, had the knowing of a tall one. That's the most Mr. Cordy or anyone had ever heard Nightlight say. And though Omric, North, Bunnemund, and Tuthiana were away in the land of dreams, 
they could still hear him, and in their sleepy minds they each were in agreement that what Nightlight had told them was exactly what they needed to hear.